Thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newbury. I'm an award-winning strategic advisor and delivery executive. I'm focused on the rapid transformation of disrupted supply chain performance across the make move sell flow of consumer products and services from production to porch and assembly floor to shelf. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space to think big, be bold, scale, adapt, and win one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available from my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check these out. As a business world faces significant volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, business leaders looking to drive market leading performance need to be tapping into thought leaders, strategic advisors, and implementation executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to give them a strong track record of transitioning enterprises to become more agile, innovative, and digital. There's great material to get through here. So let's get started. Welcome everybody to the Retail Aid podcast channel, Retailing Conversation of the 2020s. I'm an excellent crew here today. I've got George Minikakis, Jeff Roberts, and Deanne Campbell. And we're going to be talking about AI today. But before we kick off, I'm going to invite each of our crew members just to give us a quick uh, burst about background and the interest they have in this subject, and then we get going. So Jeff, could you just give us a quick one-liner? Yeah, Jeff Roberts, great to be back. Thanks for having me, Gary. Um, I'm a strategy consultant based out of London. George Minakakis, Inception Retail Group. Dan Campbell, AAG Consulting, and I help businesses create transformation roadmaps. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Now, we've got a couple of interesting subjects. The questions are actually quite fundamental to where we are in the, I wouldn't say, the adoption of AI and its implications. Many of the webinars I go to talk about the big picture but retailers and other businesses are faced with actually the harsh reality of trying to understand it and then implement that and being cautious of what the implications of, of, of this are. So I'm just going to lead into the departure points today. So as, as a business leader, what capabilities are on my checklist of things I should have in place before commencing or, or even continuing with my AI journey? to maximize the benefits from implementing a coordinated AI strategy or policy towards achieving overall business goals. And the second point, uh, what are the implications for organizational design as AI supported decision-making engulfs the organization? Do we think the internal structure may reshape? And importantly, what are the big watchouts for leaders? I'm gonna invite Jeff to, to respond to that. We have had a couple of conversations on this channel about AI, and we went into some detail about all the different types. So I'd refer back to those those particular podcasts. But for, for this one, we're going to assume you, there's a general understanding of what AI means in terms of the different technologies, but we're probably going to stretch some of our understanding within that. So Jeff, over to you. Fabulous. Thanks, Gary. Um, I, there's a lot to chew on here. So I think I'd probably come at it from the place uh, probably a bit uh, perhaps too vague or too high level given your situating, but I think it, it should start from my perspective from a what problem are you trying to solve ultimately. So I think anytime that there's an emergent technology, uh, businesses are obviously uh, quite keen to identify opportunities to apply that and to meet whatever goal need uh, requirement they might have in a particular segment. And so I think my, my opening gambit would be is that what we oftentimes see is the chasing the shiny object approach in a lot of things. So companies are incredibly good as we are individually at uh, following fads, getting excited by new things. And there's an awful lot of exciting things that are parading under the banner of AI. So I can I can understand why there is a lot of excitement there. But I think the key thing from starting this from where I would come at it is ask the question, ultimately, what problem are you trying to solve? So instead of saying, we need an AI strategy, start with the question of what do we do? How do we do it? And where potentially might this technology augment, supplant, replace, increase some activity that we're undertaking? I, I agree with you. You know, Jeff, on people, organizations and people chasing shiny objects with not really understanding what the shiny object can do. For me, the shiny object um, was a couple of years ago, like a, like a dangling carrot. Today, it is in the forefront of 
what decisions companies need to make. And the way I've been looking at this over the last really a year, I mean, I've been studying AI for seven years or more. I've been looking at this over the last year and saying, if I were running a company again, what would I need to have in place to make sure that we're going to be successful? And the number one thing that keeps popping in my head is that we're going to enter a hyper-competitive marketplace as all the tools of technology that with particularly around AI come to the forefront. Things will change. So how do I compete in that environment? You know, where it's going to be quite fast. It's not going to be this slow. We're not going to have, it's not going to be fair game or everybody has time to, to look at a competitor's response to the marketplace and come up with something different. It just won't be that way. It'll be hectic. And it, unless you have the tools in place, I just can't imagine how a company that is not at the forefront right now going to, to catch up. I love that comment, George, about not knowing what the shiny object is, because I think that's one of the biggest problems with AI and with technology in general right now. There's never a stake in the ground where it's done and technology more than anything is going to be a continuous work in progress. And what we have even two years from now will be completely different than what we have today. And it's very hard for people to budget understand what resources they're going to need and build a, a, a business model around something that you have no idea what it's going to look like in a, a relatively short amount of time. And if you're, if you're building a home, there's, there's constant work in progress, but you're building towards an end product. With the retail industry today, there, there is no end product. Change is the product. And, and I think that's a great point, Leanne. I, I would push back against the idea that we don't know. One of the things that we have to handle in a way that we haven't had to handle prior to the pandemic is, is the extent of uncertainty. We've got uncertainty on so many fronts, like geopolitical. We've actually got currently two wars going on. I mean, you know, if you go back pre-pandemic, we didn't even think about wars. So many things are changing in front of us. But one of the constants we can take control of is developing a clear vision and how to get there. And part of that plan is, is having a clear uh, technology, I would say escalation or plan, and how that technology is going to help our business establish competitive advantage over a period of time. And you know, AI may or may not fit into that. <clears throat> so I, I accept the point that AI is there. I accept the point that retailers ought to be thinking about that and even thinking about adopting it, but it has to be fitting into the roadmap. And some of those points on the roadmap may say, we need this type of capability. And at, at this point in time, it doesn't exist. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, who do we need to talk to? What software partners do we need to talk to? Which innovation centers or, you know, centers of technology do we need to be talking to to make sure these capabilities are developed in year four of our roadmap towards our vision? I can't help but, but be a consultant here and say, I think probably the challenge is roadmaps, plural. So the idea is, I think, I think particularly given the amount of change that we've experienced in, in the recent period. And I think probably what we're beginning to experience is somewhat of a, I wouldn't say an upheaval, but a, a significant change to the to the rules of business that were embedded for about the last 40 years, right? So we're starting to see a shift, a return of various and sundry things that are sort of upending what's been the broad consensus. I just said I wouldn't use upending there, I just did it. That is uh, somewhat changing the, the broad consensus of the past 40 years. So my take on this, I guess, would be is that have a think about like where, again, obviously scenario planning, I think, plays a critical role here. So what are potential ways that it could play out? And you don't necessarily have to pursue all lines simultaneously. Most organizations don't have the resources to do that. But it's the ability to simply think about what might happen, because what we got really good at, really, really, really good at, particularly in the last 20 years, is bringing what was you know, 25, 30 years ago, the pipe dream of just in time, we brought it to life, right? And so we cut all the slack out of systems. We brought, you know, the reality of moving things quickly, lowering barriers at borders, uh, increasing the, the ability and capacity across so many dimensions to deliver things, you know, where there's plenty on offer that there never has been in the past. And I think what we need to start thinking about is that as we're starting to see potential challenges to that, be they external things like war, or be they things like changing rules of commerce, if you will, so, you know, re resurgent antitrust, et cetera, that we need to start thinking about how might this play out? And it won't necessarily be one thing or another. How might they come together uh, and interact over time? And then where does that do? And then I think if we can start from maybe that perspective, it gives us a, 
a better framework into which to potentially plug something like artificial intelligence or to plug something like something else by thinking about under what scenarios might these things work and then how would it play in that in that reality the way i've been looking at this is searching for opportunities not to work but to invest um or start something and the way i'm looking at it was what will most likely be disrupted that we don't expect to be disrupted i really believe that that is um, the pivot point here, the tipping point in a, in a lot of this is to understand what will be disrupted because of AI. Once you actually identify that and it's not inside your organization, it'll be outside the organization, you know, and it may be something, how do I p pitch this? Something that's been around for 20 some odd years already that you've become, it's a staple use that we have. And all of a sudden something comes along and changes it. And we have to remember the technology that becomes adoptive happens to have some very interesting attributes to it. One, it has to be sophisticated. Two, it must be easy to use. Three, it saves money. Four, it saves time and it's accessible to everyone. Suddenly you have a huge adoption. What will that be? What will it be that will change the universe as we know it, right? Because right now I really believe a lot of companies don't see a lot of change happening. You know, it's just AI. It's going to help us identify opportunities internally. You know, we can do that with people. I've heard this. I have heard this. I have even heard companies say, but we don't need to generate our own data. We'll just buy data. Good luck with that. I think that the world is really living in a place that, oh, this might be another passing fad. It is not. We know it's not. We know that there's a lot of money being made, invested in it. Secondly, there are organizations that have already adopted it in ways that that are going to change their organizations. So I'm asking the question for myself, what will be disrupted? Once you actually start seeing it, you better have your ducks in a row at that point because it'll be too late. I think it's a mistake to think about your company as we have to decide whether to adopt AI. The truth is you're already using it. If you're using an ERP, if you're using a CRM, if you're using social media, even this Zoom call, there is an aspect of AI that is now being used by the, the vendor, by the manufacturer. And so it is, it is in your company already. And it, it's like oxygen. You have to learn how to live with this new kind of air that is creeping through your organization in ways, and George and Jeff, you both said it well, that um, you, you don't even know where the change is happening or is going to really have the greatest impact. But it, you have to start thinking about the fact that you're already using AI. It's already here. Now you have to learn how quickly, how to surround yourself with information and resources who can help you start to navigate those things as they pop up around you. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. People think they're separate from it. They're apart from it and they have a choice. There's no choice. It's here. It's already happening even without their own involvement. You're right that uh, if you ask the average retailer, you know, what do you know about AI uh, and this new thing that's coming out there? So, oh, we've already been using it for forecasting, for generating analytics, for consumer behavior and whatever else. So they're already, for many, they're already using it. But what we have is within the AI family of products, we've actually got generative AI, which is going to take us in a slightly different way. And it is an additive to this stuff, which is typically um, machine learning or deep learning versions of that, or maybe even computer vision. So all, there's going to be things that come from the AI and go into the family, and it's all going to be branded AI, but they're, they're going to give us potentially different capabilities, and we need to understand those to see where they do fit in and how we can apply those. The important thing I think that I, I picked out from what you said is we need this massive amount of data, but the thing that we seem to, that I, I think we, we, we seem to fall off the, off the plank on is that the most important thing we can have is knowledge because knowledge informs us as to what's going on and what intentional action we need to take to improve our outcomes or to gain a competitive advantage or to see a gap in the market. And I think there's a, 
there's still a gap. Uh, I was talking about this recently in, in the context of a supply chain. There's, you know, the product and how it's handled is the physicality of the supply chain. But often we, we we see diagrams in the supply chain saying product going that way and data going that way. That's not enough. Where do we pick up the idea that data gets converted into knowledge, something which allows us to impact on product and handling to improve it so we can continue to build our competitive advantage in the marketplace. You raise a really interesting point because I think, and this is, I think, one of the key challenges where I put more of an org hat on. I think this is one of the key challenges of embedding anything new into a business. And and, and broadly, it's a result of, of the fact that like it requires a capability to activate it. So you're absolutely right. Can't, there's great points here. It exists. It's everywhere. It's 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 in the water. It's in the air we breathe. It's all the, it's it's happening around us. But I think to, to come back to the point that you're talking about, Gary, to really wring the life out of something new. And I think supply chain is a great example because supply chain was one of the early functions to adopt more stochastic modeling. The idea of being able to just um, a greater willingness to take on early machine learning applications and, and what became branded a lot of AI. And I think this is the big challenge, right? So I roll out the word stochastic and then suddenly like faces go blank in most conversations that I'm having. And, and the whole idea is that, yeah, because it's not something that we wander around talking about. But the reality of the matter is, is that, yeah, there's a great deal of, of, of probabilistic uncertainty out there. And there are models that exist to attempt to reduce some of that uncertainty to, or at least clarify it. But then the challenge becomes, how do you bring that back into the business? You know, if I rewind the tape, say 10, 15 years, at an earlier phase of my career, when everybody wanted data teams and they got embedded everywhere, every function had a data team. There were people that sat across data teams. There was master data management that was sitting somewhere in IT that suddenly, you know, and then you heard the lament of every sort of newly founded group, which was, well, what do I do? So you need to hire all these high powered people coming out of graduate programs who've been taught to do all kinds of stuff. And then suddenly they rock up and really, really what most businesses wanted was an Excel spreadsheet. You know, they really wanted a dashboard that worked in Excel and then Power BI once that came bundled with Microsoft 360. So I think this is the big challenge to my mind, which is that you've got something which is frankly akin to magic, you know, the math that underpins it and the things that we're increasingly able to do with it. The question becomes, how do you create an organization or create a capacity in the organization to not only absorb it, but to translate it into something that can happen? Now, obviously, we've worked around this in the past with other IT systems, right, where you just bake it into the system and then you rework the organization around it. You know, early ERP's implementations were, you know, bottom-up role builds of this is the new process. And that was painful and everybody hated it, but eventually everybody complied, right? So I think you've got sort of two options. And I think what we're going to see is a great deal of, for lack of a better word, rockiness, where there's going to be a lot of investment that never gets realized because there's simply not capacity to ingest it. And I think that, to my mind, is the real challenge, is that absolutely this stuff is out there, it's rolling, it's happening. But I think what you're going to find is what we saw with a lot of like early moves into building data teams, which is that there'll be a lot of upfront investment. And then the organization won't be able to ingest it. And then they become a line item on a PL that somebody looks at and goes, well, why do we need that? And so that's that's my concern is that you increasingly find the organization falls back into the old routines of we got to cut some heads, you know, and those are the ones that are going to go because nobody can tell me what they do. And so I think that's the big challenge. I think irrespective of it, and it is magic. I mean, I know I'm a skeptic on it, but what it does is incredible. I think, you know, the, the models that underpin it are incredibly impressive we always come back to the same thing that ultimately the organization has to be able to ingest it. And in the absence of a speed with which to do that, the organization falls back on the old habit of, well, that was a, that was a nice day. And that's where my fear is. Jeff, there is that, but I'm a little more optimistic about it in terms of I've lived in a corporate life where I need information now. Right. And that didn't exist. It exists today which gives me the at the advantage over if I have, see the human part will always exist in, in a business. It's, it's media is telling you humans will no longer exist in businesses that they have more to lose, by the way. But at the end of the day, you still need humans to run companies who need to think, but they need information and they need it today. And I've gone through a life where, you know, I, I had an idea, I was looking for some information or something, It'd take two or three days to get it. But remember, you know, I'm dating myself, but 15 years ago, not even 15 years ago, Jeff, as you probably, and, and Deanne probably know, IT department was in a dark room somewhere in the back with no windows, right? And who were they? They were people that made sure the systems worked. Um, you know, the internet is down or the systems aren't connected properly. You know, my laptop's not working. No, that those days have to be over. 
And the information that these people are able to produce needs to come to the forefront in an organization. It can no longer be behind the scenes. And my view of it is if I were to restructure a company today, I would say the brand is up here. AI is in the middle. All the functions become disciplines and everybody working in them becomes an intelligence officer. Because I think that you want to recreate this in a way that everybody's integrated into the systems working. I'm not saying we're there yet, but I, I will say that I read a few weeks ago that Walmart gave access to some 50,000 white collar employees um, to a chat GPT, like a generative AI application that's connected to their cloud with all their data. And what they want to see is how creative their employees can get. Now, you can everybody can speculate on what that really leads to if you want to, but it's interesting because that is what's referred to as the beginnings of an AI factory. And that changes organizations. This is a gentle approach to it. But this is going to this is going to continue to happen, and I believe that organizations that get created in the in the future to come will start that way. They're not going to be starting with the with the old hierarchies that we've been used to for so many years. It no longer can can run that way, and I, I believe that it's the best way. But I will tell you that um, when I when I'm looking at AI, you do feel sometimes like you're chasing the future with it, right? But there is a lot of technology out there that has been developed. It's no longer in its infancy. It is maturity and advancement, right? I was been reading and I've been sharing this with a few others. In turn, uh, it's called Inflection AI. Um, Inflection AI is an organization that is run by the guy by the name of uh, Suleiman. He came from DeepMind. He was one of the founders. And what they've done is they created this social uh, AI where it helps people, you know, with their stress and everything. And I went on it. It's actually pretty cool. There's a voice. But what's really interesting about it, it has memory. It actually remembers your last conversation. And that is pretty cool. Only from an application point of view, if you start thinking about integrating these with consumers, because you see, I really believe that's where the evolution begins. And businesses have no choice but to start adapting very quickly at that point. Because as human creatures, we have this one thing that we will never let go of. We want more friggin' time to ourselves. I don't want to be doing things that you want me to be doing. I want my free time. So convenience is very important. It always has been, and it will continue to be that. So when technology reaches the consumer, and it will, AI does reach the consumer in this way, watch things change much faster. And I think that is where, that's where my mind is, you know, but I'm looking for that opportunity, right? And I've grasped out some of it in terms of where I think it's going, but that to me is the place. It's the consumer that's going to drive whatever we think of organizations, whether they should pursue them or not. It's the consumer that's going to push them into it, whether they want it or not. We've got a great example of that with a smartphone. I mean, it, there was a slow, you know, it, it it broke on the market, a few early adopters, and they showed it to their friends. And, oh, what's all that about? And all of a sudden, it, is it something like 90, 95% of the, the plant has got mobile phones now? And I think that chat GPT equivalent or uh, personal AI assistant, whatever format might be, take and it may actually be embedded into this so that you it's a ubiquitous device i think that's going to drive businesses maybe particularly retailers to move from the analog 1.0 world and they're probably in analog 2.0 trying to digitize parts of an analog process and i think it's going to shift them into digital 1.0 and i think that that will elicit a certain change in how they see their, their world, their culture, their structure, how they get things done, uh, because they have to respond to that at a much faster pace than they've had to respond to even the pandemic or the cost of living crisis or, you know, as I said earlier, you know, a couple of wars or whatever it is. I think that the acceleration of something in the hands of a consumer, once it, they've got mass adoption, it is a real call to action. If we think about the, the smartphones it, here in Canada, the smartphone happened in 2007. In 2017, our leading retailer, Mr. Galen Weston, was reported, because I read it, of saying that 
I'm putting in, a, a, I think it was 104 click and collect operations in my network of I don't know, 1,700, but I don't think it will take off. It's only because people didn't know what it was and they didn't know what they were missing. And if you looked at the, the comparison between shopping in any grocer here and versus somebody else doing it and just a, a drive up, somebody puts it into, into my boot and off I go, you don't know what you're missing until you have it. If I could just interject quick, quickly. Um, I've been following voice assistance for a few couple of years now. The forecast is that 8.4 billion requests will be made in, during 2024. So if you think of Alexa and Siri, 8.4 billion requests, some 50% of them, a little bit more in historically, have actually prompted these devices to try and do shopping, whether they'd shop directly or not. Uh, that's not my problem. It's theirs, but because they're still, still very clunky systems. But at the end of the day, when you think about how many requests are going to be made of them, right, the, the, the technology that's available that Gary's talking about is there, it can only improve. And as it does, these requests will increase because, um, and I'll tell you one more thing that in a hospital in Japan, they have this panel on the side near the, the patients who are very old, old um, and the button is for help, right? Or information. And they press the button and the hospital realized what they were doing. They were just talking to the system because they were lonely. And that's sad. So they changed it so that actually it can communicate with something, with machine, right? So I'm just saying, watch the world. It's evolving in front of you. I get very excited about the possibilities that lie in store for companies through AI. And I view it, tend to view it as an opportunity more than a problem. But I also recognize the, the clunkiness of most organizations. And that's across every industry. There is going to be a great temptation to put AI-related decisions under the IT department, make that the purview of IT because it's technology and we're going to put all of that under the IT bucket. That, that's going to cause more problems than it will solve. And I think it speaks to the fact that organizations need to completely rethink the roles of each department the uh, decision-making process and the interconnectivity between those departments. So redefining what an IT department really is and will the IT department of the future actually be the CEO path because they're going to be responsible for the overarching connectivity of all the decisions of the company. If that's the case, then it's time to get busy restructuring that department and looking at hiring different people so that you have people who are fundamentally biased towards connecting with different departments. I'm thinking of marketing and IT, you know, supply chain and marketing and IT, the operations team. And this is going to be really critical because the empowerment that AI is going to give to the technology we already have, much less the technology of the future. Think about shelf scanning robots that go up and down the aisles and they collect data in real time on the products. Great. You get a dashboard, you understand. If you're, if you're really smart, you've connected that data to your supply chain. Great. But what about connecting it to the operations team so they understand which products are turning over quicker, the merchandising teams, the marketing teams, the outsourced vendor who's responsible for package design so they can make changes to packages that are, that are not catching consumers' attention. All of these people now have the ability to see that data and have AI interpret it on their behalf. So it's really quickly actionable and understandable, but the structure of companies is not really designed to handle decision-making at that kind of speed. And cross communication and decision making that involves that many people it, it's a completely different way of thinking but we're going to have to get there quickly because from a, a, a capability standpoint we're already there that's the giant challenge right is that how do you drive coordination this is always the problem is that how do you actually embed and manage coordination within and god help you outside of the organization i mean it, it how do you how do you do that 
And there are obviously a whole set of, and so I guess this is what I'm saying is that the technology itself is incredible. I'm not in any way discounting that. Governance ultimately, and I mean that as like an umbrella term that comes to manage all of the division of labor, the workflow, the, the decision rights, et cetera, becomes the real challenge. And I think, you know, and there's some, there's some really cool stuff happening. I mean, I know they get a bad rap, but there's some really cool stuff happening with a lot of academic work on this right now. There's a whole team at NCED working on AI-enabled organization governance, and there's some really quite interesting stuff that's coming out of it. It's nascent. I don't buy into a lot of it, but there's there's some interesting stuff that's coming out of it. And we can, we've can we seen, quite frankly, cack-handed attempts at it with like when we saw DAOs and things like that emerge. I mean, fundamentally, somebody needs to be in charge. It doesn't really matter who. I mean, I think that's the dirty secret nobody wants to say, but ultimately, it's somebody needs to be in charge, right? Hierarchies are naturally occurring in organizational contexts, and somebody needs to sit atop of it. And so it needs to be managed that way. So I think to me, the big challenge is, and I, and, and we've been through this, or at least in my career, have been through multiple iterations of different ways of governing things. I lived a very brief period through, um, um, was it hel holocracies that Zappos had? Dear God, you know, where nobody was in charge, and it was just teams that sort of talked to each other. You know, I've lived through that. I've lived through like, you know, delayering. I've gone through the whole, we need more VPs, whatever, right? I've lived through all of that. And so, and I'm sure there's there's an infinite nor variety of it that, that's there to come. I think it fundamentally comes down to that challenge. And I think, again, not to say that improving technology can't change, alter, improve them. I think it's possibly that it can. I think more often than not, we tend to put the cart before the horse where we roll a technology in and then ask, well, why isn't this working? Or this was meant to do X. And so I think, you know, it, it comes back to a lot of the problems, I think, that are intractable in most organizations, which is that the people who commission projects oftentimes don't understand how the organization works. And that, I think, is always going to be a problem, right? That's always going to be a fundamental challenge. And so I think in many ways, there are some really low tech things that need to happen to make this really happen, right? So it's about really understanding what's happening, getting the right people in the right place to do it you know, accepting that it may not be instantaneous. You know, it's all the classic things that we all read and nod and go, yes, that's right. You know, this is something we should do. Very few businesses do it because you're you're responding to a different set of demands that generally constrain your ability to make those things happen in the slow, painful way that they tend to happen. And so I guess that's where my head keeps coming back to, which is there's a lot of really cool things happening here, but the underlying challenges that bedevil every organizational context are pretty stable. How are you going to govern this thing? What's the appropriate division of labor? What's the appropriate decision rights? You know, how do you embed those in? I mean, we've all lived through discussions around controls, right? I mean, there's just no more painful discussion than around what's the control framework for this. It's critical, but it's not in any way sexy. It's not fun, you know, and you can automate the hell out of it. And I've been on those projects where you automate the hell out of controls and it's bedded into a workflow. But the point is, is that I just keep saying is that that's the huge challenge is that ultimately you got to come back to figure out how do you put a wrapper around this thing that enables it to work, not only internally, but to work in a way that is legible to the outside world. You know, most large organizations that are going to go into this are listed and like brokers calls where they bring up AI, it tends to be, what are you doing? And, but then they follow that with, and what's the incremental increase that we're going to see in EPS on this? There's all these conflicting narratives that have to be played with is how do you take this very cool thing? How do you make it work in a very already chaotic context and then how do you create an output that's legible to those that oftentimes have a lot of sway over your business that you have no control over so i think these are the, the big challenges to my mind i think we're going to see the rise of a new type of in-house legal team as well because as we all know ai pulls from what we ourselves as a world feed it and sometimes those things are not exactly right <laughs> necessarily and even today, there are already decisions being made, things being put out there in the world based on what has come back from AI that have turned out to be incorrect. And so I think it's going to be a, a big responsibility that a lot of organizations are not yet prepared to handle to create this accountability system and uh, decide on an ethical stance, communicate that ethical stance, and then inject that into the organization to create fail safes and checks and balances for an out of control AI capability. I'm going to take this a little bit backwards a bit. Um, I remember about a few years ago, uh, five or six years ago, maybe where a lot of executives reached out to me and said, George, you know, I don't get how you can make money uh, out of omni channels. I just don't see the return. 
And, you know, they're waiting a long time for it. And in, in the beginning, I kind of tended to agree with them. Like, you know, it's a, it's a long-term investment and you've got to wait and play it out. But a presentation that I did a couple of weeks ago, I actually said the data is your new ROI. And, you know, it was kind of, you know, peered back, you could see it, right? The CEO uh, who was hosting this meeting um, basically said, good point. And he goes, and I can see the day when data will be part of assets and organizations will be evaluated based on that. I think I'm pretty sure that that day is close. And that was set the tone for organizations to have to change even faster. Only because when you look at data by way of its value, I've tried to acquire companies and uh, my business partner went into one and met with the CFO who happened to be 83 years old and said to him, George and I want to know what, you know, what data assets you have. And he goes, he just says, no, 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 you can't. No, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about that stuff. He goes, besides it's legacy. We've lost the keys to that a long time ago, right? So you have to ask yourself, how many organizations are in that place where they have a lot of legacy uh, pl platforms, how to integrate them, how to make them work together, probably can't. The amount of money that would actually take to invest, to put make the changes, all this over, is probably outside of their reach. So a lot of companies are going to be struggling with in the future is if I'm going to be evaluated based on my data and how I'm using it to actually get to make decisions, suddenly the world is changing. And even in M&As, you know, I just can't see an, M an MBA working for a private equity firm that's not going to be looking at the data and say, you know, so where is it? You know, how are you using this to drive revenue? I think that that is, for me, that is where all of this is uh, kind of rooting itself and organizations that are want to be around for a long time. The challenge really here is to get to be smart about what you're setting yourself up for. I'm separating AI out of this comment right now it is that collecting data and being able to use it is one big challenge in itself. AI evolves you into a different place, but just data on its own, I think organizations struggle with that in itself already. You raise a really good point, uh, which kind of drives me to where the money is, because there's already a big disconnect between what makes a company viable for the long term and what investors want to pay for. For example, in retail, investors love e-commerce. They love companies that are really promoting e-commerce and working on e-commerce. But of course, your profit margins are much greater in brick and mortar. And so that disconnect there is just going to be amplified with AI. And there's a great temptation, I'm sure, and it's already underway, of reducing headcount because you're supplementing with AI. You're allowing AI to make some decisions on your behalf. And investors love that. And yet humans working with it, it really, AI works best when it amplifies the abilities of a human, not replaces them. How do you communicate with investors? How do you work in, with investors in a new way to get the space that you need to actually make things work well and give you that, that fail safe and that ability to be prepared for changes or problems or issues or new ideas as they come up? And what makes an investor want to give you money for your seed round? <laughs> I wonder when somebody will break cover. What CEO of a public listed company beyond Jeff Bezos? Well, maybe it could be helpful if he, he did it. Uh, and actually say, do you know this e-commerce thing? Unless it's small cube, high margin product in a local geography. It's not making money. Why are you asking us to consider it more? Uh, if we consider it from a commercial point of view of the overall customer proposition, that's one thing. But saying that if I write something nice about, you know, e-commerce or AI or whatever, uh, and just try and buy myself to the next quarter and hope that something good has happened that I can point to and say, look, I was right. Uh, you know, when when do we break cover on, on, on this subject? When does some CEO take their ball to task, show them the numbers, give them the data to say these segments of markets that we're in through the e-commerce or direct-to-consumer, however we want to express it, are unprofitable. Do you want us to continue? Because it will have an impact on the earnings per share. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say just while, while, while we're here, we actually had a really good digital transformation 
podcast, but one that probably might be helpful for people that I can refer to is one that actually Deanne was on and Ricardo Bilma. And we actually talked through some of the big issues that we keep bumping into, which result in digital transformation, whether well, it's the adoption of AI or order management system or whatever it might be, a warehouse management system. Uh, about 90% of these projects actually fail and they fail for a whole range of reasons. And most of those reasons are things that we could do something about at an early stage, maybe killing off a project before it even starts or make sure that if for anything that goes through the, through the grill actually gets full support until it's actually delivered. But uh, mostly there are failures around scope, cost overrunning, timelines, or if even if it was delivered, that um, the, the re return on investment just wasn't there. The realizable values just wasn't, you know, the business case was a bit flaky just to get it over the hump uh, and look, it didn't materialize. So I help people by pointing them to that uh, previous podcast. It's a recent one. There's so many good points that have come up in this discussion, and I'm just going to grab a couple of them because I think they... I think they frame this whole thing. So like, I really like when Deanne was talking about it might give rise to a new legal, a new legal function. And then you know, George talks about you've got the idea of it becomes a new asset to be dealt with. Because I think they point to what I think is the, is the crux of the issue here, which is if you think about it, what AI can potentially do inside of an organization or even with managing some types of third party relationships outside of the organization is, is super helpful from an operational perspective. And then that subsequently changes the way that we might think about how the business runs. You know, when we saw earlier waves of this in the 20th century, we saw the transition from CEOs coming out of, say, marketing backgrounds, and then it transitioned in sort of the 50s to the 70s and then to present more finance driven, right? So and that, that represented an external orientation to public markets that was increasingly taking over um, large firms. So that was an internal dynamic that was responsive largely to something external. And so what we can see is as well is that when we think about, you know, the new asset class that comes as your data, does that ramp up your valuation or, or how you're considered as an organization? That led me to, I think, what is the crux of the issue is that we've got an operational change that this particular technology might be able to implement in the way the business operates. And then the normal things that cascade as a result of that operational change. So to George's earlier point that IT went from the windowless office in the basement to, you know, they actually got some some sunlight because they're doing things that the business can more readily do something with. And then what we could see is that, you know, legal, which has traditionally seldom been a route to, say, C-suite um, on its own, could potentially look very different as a result of that. Because if you're just managing a bunch of what is broadly unmanageable or ambiguous things, you've got a function that does that, which is legal, and they excel at it. They're very, very good at trying to bring clarity. So the internal changes that are there, I think what's super interesting, though, is when we look through the asset class lens is that there's an external change, which I think in many ways might stymie what these internal changes are capable of doing, or at least could potentially reshape them. I was reading um, an analyst called, they were asking, oh, it was the Google Microsoft ones, because obviously Google's been hit for the cloud business not doing as well. Microsoft did okay, and so they got a slight bump. And there was an interesting question on the analyst call, which I think points to what we might be looking at here, which was, you're talking about embedding AI in. You know, it was a good question, but then it ends with, and what's the incremental improvement we might expect for EPS next year? And so what I think what we're starting to see is that you get this internal operational change, which can have the way that it changes on how the business organizes and what it does. But as long as you have what we have now, and I can't see it changing in the very near future, which is a very strong orientation to public markets. So there's a strong financial element to this. There will always be that push to the point like Deanne was making. Let's cut some heads. We got AI to do that. You know, it used to be the statement in ERP for the early part of my career. You just spent 400 million on SAP. Who can you get rid of? And, you know, and it was that sort of idea. And it was it, the idea was that it was just that it would come in and by magic change it. And because there's a necessity to meet those public expectations and to meet those external narratives, that in many ways shapes the way that the project at least starts if not the way that it ultimately ends. So, you know, that's what I see as the fundamental, I guess the, it's not really, a, I don't think it stymies or it stops it, but I think it's the challenge that it faces, which is that you've got this amazing thing that might very well have significant operational improvement uh, potential. But then you also have an orientation towards public markets that have a very different view of your organization. And trying to balance those two things is, is going to be tricky, I think. And I think that, to my mind, is the dynamic that will, shape a lot of how this plays out. Sorry, that was a very long drawn out, but I, there were so many good points there. I just wanted to try to weave it into the way that was shaking up in my head. 
That exact point is why I think there's going to be a storm of mergers and acquisitions over the next couple of years like we have never seen before. Because of that investor diversion <clears throat> from operational need, companies don't have time to build what they need, so they're going to have to borrow it or buy it. And so that adds even more uncertainty and flexibility and change to an organization's structure. In addition to the AI, I think we're going to see a lot of organizations throw their hands up in the air, put themselves up for sale, or uh, you're going to see a lot more mergers and people taking on things like shop and shops or partnerships or any anything they can do to try to buy themselves a little bit of space. I was taught very early, never let the lawyers run the company. <laughs> so... I got myself in trouble a week ago over the same statement, by the way. So I completely agree that, you know, there's ethics and governance that needs to be taken care of. I completely agree with that. But there's always the risk uh, that you become, and I've seen this happen, uh, you become too risk adverse. It's a dangerous, murky place to go to because lawyers, they're good. And if you listen to them very carefully and you trust, and there's no reason not to trust them internally, right? They're part of your team they can actually invoke a level of, of, of fear that can stop a company from moving forward. And it's not just lawyers, by the way, right? I mean, there's other things too, that other people that can do that internally in your organization as well. What I want to bring it to is that I do see AI evolving to as a service to a lot of smaller organizations. I see that evolving at some point. Um, so whatever assets, you know, I, I know that it's already happening, but I see more of it because Independence, for example, probably are more the most, they may seem the most vulnerable. My research is showing that they're not the most vulnerable when it comes to AI because they live in this symbiotic little world of their own with local communities and everything. And it's a destination for that local community. But not everybody is going to be impervious to it. So you have to think about how you engage yourself in that. But at the end of the day, I also sense there's a, a huge amount of resistance in organizations as well. Um, I encountered that uh, over the last few weeks where we don't need AI, but I believe the resistance is fear-driven and protection. Oh, here we go, Gary, silos. I hate silos with a passion. I've seen how destructive they can be. I've seen them. I believe that they're protection-oriented. I will bet all my money on the fact that every retailer that has failed, gone, they were living in silos. Don't worry, boss. I don't think this is going to, you have to worry about uh, e-commerce. I don't think you have to worry about digital. I don't think you have to worry about omni-channels. I am sure those discussions were had. Poor CEO took the fall for all of it. Talk to people at Blockbuster. The organizations really need to start rethinking themselves too, that silos need to be broken. And I come back to what I said earlier about functions need to become disciplines. And those disciplines need to be run by people who are going to be intelligence officers and no more silos because there are silos in silos protecting information. I, I'm not going to bore you with this number, but um, if you think about how much data is on the internet, I'm not going to go through the numbers. I will just say to you that it's 140, 120 zettabytes, which 21 zeros after that, by the way, that is what's on the internet. What we don't know is all of the stuff that has, we have, as humans have created in the past that's not been put on the internet. And that exists in companies, right? Everything that's been put on a piece of paper that's never been put into a system anywhere, somebody's sitting on some beautiful rocket that can go from here to Mars in a day, and you'll never know it because they're protecting their job. Things must change. That will be my sign for mom. Things must change. I kind of feel that Jeff is chomping at the bit on this one, but I'm going to dive straight in. Recently, I did a small piece on supply chain management and uh, and how it will either embrace or not embrace AI uh, and leveraging off of uh, George's point there. Uh, I, I think there are three big areas. There's data. The idea of that is converting that somehow into knowledge. So not only actionable insights, but knowledge of how the process works, what we need to do to the process to to continue to on our path of, towards a competitive advantage. Uh, the second one is collaboration. Now, I don't mean sitting down and having a nice cup of tea with with your supplier. I'm talking about collaboration where you know two sets of people have very clear needs and both sets are met as opposed to compromised. Uh, and the third one is visionary leadership. 
Uh, and we tried to categorize the market by, you know, independent national retailers, you know, international retailers, whatever. I think that we, we need to be thinking about the availability of that visionary leadership that can actually start to think about and has a brief to start to change organizational thinking, which will naturally follow through into organizational structure. And whether or not it might look the same, and I think George is saying that the basic functions will, will still exist, but AI or the use of data within this context where we can't hide, we can't hide behind the silo wall, it would be in the open. And it would get in the open because of visionary leadership and collaboration. Uh, that will trigger or catalyze a change in how people, you know, fundamental culture, how people work together, they will start to see that, you know, I used to sit in this silo in, say, supply chain, and those people in merchandisers, they just don't understand the business. And uh, people in merchandising will say the same about supply chain. I get it. But imagine that the data is there for all to see. Uh, and we're actually collaborating with that data to improve the business as opposed to improve our performance on our department bu budget. So, I, I think that AI is a trigger for this revolution in how we think inside organizations about our organizational structure, our culture, and, and how what we're trying to do in the marketplace. That revolution is already happening. We're not seeing the results of it yet. Because if you look at our educational system, we've had businesses do things in the same way and these siloed structures, which I also hate, George, with a white hot passion. <laughs> Most business schools teach kind of the same thing. So we're reaping the results of that. Today, those educations are unaffordable by a large portion of society. And with free online classes and alternative education methods and kids just getting creative about DIY degrees, I think within the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a very different type of thinker start to assume some of the leadership ranks and work their way up. And that's the way it has to be. I can't wait for that to happen. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But that's really the scope of the kind of change and the degree of change we're going to need. It's in progress. It's not here yet. And I think the, the leaders of today just don't have the tools or the haven't been brought up in the environment that is conducive to the kind of thinking that is going to be needed going forward. I'm, I'm going to get super contentious here. So um, so finally, Joe, you've awake, Gary. It's, uh, so I, my view on this is probably twofold and, and slightly jaded by my own background. So silos are a hassle. I agree. But they're generally a hassle if you're a consultant or if you're the one at top trying to make something happen. Silos actually serve for pretty valuable purposes. So I won't give my whole in defense of silos, but they're very good for sort of collating and capturing knowledge, allowing it to foster and grow. They can stop organizations from running at speed into competency traps. Place that run too fast tend to get ahead of themselves and fall over. So yeah, there is a little bit of good to come from a bit of drag. Now, I say that I say that as a former academic. The management consultant in me is like, Man, to hell with silos. I can't get anything done in this place. Nobody has the information. So like, I, I get it, right? It's it's a nightmare. But I had to get that little plug in. I have to every time I hear it. As that it depends on where you sit as to how you feel about silos. So th there's value there, I think. I think the real challenge, again, it comes down to the fact that I keep coming back to the same thing, which is that there are low-key, low-tech issues, like no-tech issues, that just emerge as a result of organizing. And so by the time you get a group of people and then you put a process in play, and then something starts happening. And you start to get weird dynamics at about five, right? You don't need huge numbers of people. Around five will generally give you enough variation that you can see some interesting stuff happen. So it becomes difficult, I think, to start things moving. You know, where I think if there is an opportunity to, to drive change using artificial intelligence, to my mind, it's about addressing that problem that we've talked to before, which is if you can use it as a, as a coordination mechanism, I spent my early career avoiding any ERP implementations. But on the, the, the couple I got dragged into, like the, what made it work well and what really worked was when it automated a lot of the flow, then when you could get people out of the mix. But it forced the most difficult conversations in any organization, right? I mean, we've all been there in front of a giant piece of brown paper covered in post-it notes where somebody's yelling at somebody else about, I didn't realize it worked that way, right? So when you when you start going through that sort of thing, but that's the kind of stuff I think that really ultimately matters. 
there's real value by forcing standardization for standardization matters where the challenge is, I think, is oftentimes, and again, I'm broken record here, the people commissioning projects don't necessarily understand where, where standardization would work. You know, and, and, and I've discovered this in my own career as I got more senior, all the things I used to bitch about when I was younger, and I'll never do that. You reach a point in your career where you're like, the role demands behavior. You don't get a choice anymore, right? The role demands a set of behaviors that you didn't think you would ever do. You know, words pass my lips now that I'm like, I would never say that. So, and then I find myself saying that thing. And that's the role. The role makes the demand that, that, that something has to happen. And so I think these are the kind of challenges. And I think if we come in at eyes wide open, I think there's huge opportunities here. You know, I think this is always the challenge for any sort of major change or any sort of whatever we call it. I saw recently Accenture's transformation's dead. It's reinvention now. So, I mean, I'm like, all right, that's a new generation of terms that we got to hold up now. But the idea being is, to my mind, is that if we can come in this eyes wide open and we say, right, we've got to deal with some really low tech, no tech, just existence level stuff. I think there's huge opportunity here. Um, you know, we need to figure out, like having the conversation, how does this thing actually work? What do we actually want to do? What problem are we ultimately trying to solve? And they're painful, you know, oftentimes boring conversations to have. But to my mind, that's the baseline stuff. And I think if we can get over that, I think that's always the huge opportunity comes. All right, well, clearly we want to do X. And we want to do X and we can define out. I always laugh at a company. It's like, you got a five-year plan. I'm like, man, God bless you. If, if I were, I struggle to get five minutes ahead. So it's just about trying to get to the, the best example I ever read was, was imagine you're wandering through a fast growing jungle. And as you hack your way through, you make your way to a plateau. All you have is an opportunity to look around before it grows around you. And that's fine. So just keep moving, right? You just got to keep going and just get you to the next step. And I think that's where the value comes and the value will come from, from applications like this is when they're used in a way that's about how does this move us to the next step that allows us to get a clearing to see what might be over the horizon to get us to the next one, to get us to the next one. And I, I think a lot of this is it always comes down to it's framing, right? It's around how do you frame the issue? How are you dealing with it? And it's like the analyst asking, how is this going to be a cruise of, to EPS? You know, it's if they frame the problem in one of the thing they care about. And I think we need to get an opportunity to frame it in a way that makes more sense for the whatever part of the organization is adopting the thing at the time. Jeff, you you, you uh, exposed me. Um, yes, we all have had to do things that, and say things that we regret <laughs> in our roles. Uh, and yeah, I certainly would have to admit that I had different ideals before I embarked on the world of business. So um, I wanted to save society. I still do. But it was, you know, I was informed that it wasn't possible. But in any event, I will tell you how I have framed AI uh, within an organization. I actually wrote this out. I'm trying to remember it from memory, so forgive me if I mess it up. But it's the integration of human and artificial intelligence to identify, define, develop, and deliver the next generation of strategies and innovations to compete in a shifting marketplace. That's how I've defined it. So I'm framing it in a way that it doesn't do away with people. You know, I think that, yes, you know, I think somebody, one of you mentioned earlier that people are just going to, everybody's going to jump with the AI and reduce headcount. Well, that's what you do to please the marketplace, right? That's not what you do to, to win in the marketplace. But if you're smart enough and grasp what I just said, the intent of AI is to integrate human and artificial intelligence to work together. Then suddenly you've got a new foundation to work from so that you can actually develop stronger organizations that perform. Right now, I think, you know, the shiny thing, as you mentioned in the beginning, Jeff, is I'm going to pay productivity or I'm going to make things faster, you know, or I'm going to become Superman, you know, whatever you want to do with it. At the end of the day, the, the, the thing I want to solve is how do I compete more effectively and faster in the marketplace in a very responsible and responsive way that allows me to grow share? That is what I want. I think this is also going to help organizations position themselves in, in new ways that they have not conceived of before. And so that open mindset to what kind of company am I going to be, what is it I actually do for a living as an organization, um, that's going to need, uh, the AI is going to make rethinking that very weird and very, very interesting. 
Amazon, when Jeff Bezos started that business, he was thinking of it as I'm going to sell books. And now the product is not what he's, he's selling products as a means to be a data organization. All those product sales are not the reason for being anymore. And technology has allowed him to evolve into a business that uh, it really feeds AWS and data and services um, to other companies. Artificial intelligence is only going to take it in even in a different direction that, that has yet to be predicted. So a lot of organizations target, I keep going back to target, targets becoming more and more of just a retailer that uh, hosts other brands and businesses in their stores rather than um, products in their own right. That's the direction they're heading. AI is just going to make that even more possible and more profitable. So that that's going to be part of the transformation process is really identifying where you can win in the marketplace rather than compete. I love how you said that, George. At the moment, let's say if we're in retail, um, we, we look at rate of sales and stuff like that. And we look at the market and f- for a few brochures if we're in fashion and we go, right, we're going to get into there. AI will change that because we'll have real time information. We'll have inferences from that in real time. And the things that will happen there will automatically trigger changes across our supply chain to bring that product into place, put it on the shelf so we can uh, optimize our, our ability. But also other retailers are doing this. They're doing their brand of AI in their context. But I think that uh, I'm, I'm going to be super contentious now. Uh, I, I think there's just too much milk and honey pie. I, I can't remember the phrase of it, but we, we think that we're going to take low level uh, activity, people doing low level activity. So don't worry, your jo- job is safe. We're going to give you high level activity. Well, what is a high level activity? That's at the end of algorithms, which are you're going to throw data at the algorithm. The, the, the algorithm is going to make the decision. It's going to manage the exception, whatever it is. They've got nowhere to go. The way that George described this, we're going to have a like a some kind of matrix organization, and we are going to have functions. And those people, they're intelligence officers, I think they're exception management officers in the sense of they're checking for these algorithms to see what exceptions weren't covered already in history or already in testing. And they're going to see an exception that's happened maybe across the supply chain, not just within their organization, but, you know, far out into the you know tier four supplier and go, right, we need to just tweak this algorithm again to really reduce our you know 99% um, covered by the algorithm to 99.9%. So they're going to be doing that. They're going to be resetting how our organization interact on a continuous basis. And they're going to be working together to look at the marketplace. What do we need to do? Where is the white space? Right, there it is straight in front of us, real time. We're going to now construct products that are going to fit directly into that segment. So we are going to be hyper competitive. I think that we're we're missing the point, not not this group, but I think in the general narrative is that don't worry, AI is going to come to us and we're all going to be okay. We're just going to be, you know, less busy doing mundane jobs and more uh, interest, more extended or exercised on this really high level work. It's not going to happen. AI is going to do that. It's not going to be for humans to do the high level work because we haven't got the computational power interest appetite on average to be able to do that work i can't help when i'm hearing this to think of the um keynes's view written in 1930 of what the world would look like turn of the century and according to keynes we should be well into our 15-hour week now right so this we shouldn't be working more than that and i think what we found is that what what tends to happen is that there's a demand for that surplus time that we find ourselves with to be devoted to additional effort you know that that's broadly where it's been and so i think you know there, there's there's definitely you know so i think there's again I, I come back to the you've got to think about the existing organizational and i mean that not just in like business firm but like how things are put together and you know the rules of the game all the way down to you know how we how we put things together um you know relationships between states businesses whatever is we have to accept that the, that reality we're going to have to nest into that existing thing. And again, I think that the, for this to be realized, for the promise that we've discussed here today to be realized, some big things need to change outside of that. So, and I think 
you know, I've pointed to it. You know, we've the businesses have been increasingly financialized, particularly in the last 25 years. Um, started in the early 80s, but it really picked up speed. You know, where there's increasing orientation towards external markets, the demands from. I mean, let's let's face it, right? I mean, and this is no slight on 28 year old analysts calling into earnings calls asking questions. But the fact of the matter is, is that what they're focused on is an input to go build an Excel model so that they can tell you whether or not this is a buy, hold, or sell, right? And that's fine. But when we're increasingly orienting things in that direction, it makes things a little more difficult to maneuver because you have to take activities that move you in that position. And then, you know, if we see things, you know, a lot of the opportunity comes from automating down the chain, you know, that comes into, okay, well, how do you manage, how do you govern cross-organization data sharing? When does it move from just moving things along at speed into anti-competitive behavior? You know, that's a question I don't have an answer to, but it's something other people are thinking about. Far above my pay grade, people are looking at. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and I'm not denying any of that opportunity. And I love George's definition because I think it's broadly spot on. You know, I think this is exactly the way we should be thinking about it. I think about, you know, I come from a family of miners, and I think about how much easier it must have been when my grandfather transitioned from using a pickaxe to explosives, right? It must have been a lot easier to get things done. So the, the reality of the matter is, is that these things can definitely improve the operation of the underlying work, and they should definitely be embraced, and we should look for opportunities to do that. And I'm 100% for let's find more meaningful activity for people to do, et cetera. I think we just have to recognize that it gets nested into an existing framework. And if I come down from the clouds to the ground level, if we think retail in specific, you know, part of what makes retail fantastic is stores and activity in those stores. And while we can automate the hell out of the back end of what's coming into them and how the assortment gets managed and how we're managing the logistics through to um, to a placement on shelf and how we're capturing information on sales volume, whatever, that's amazing. And that's great. And we should fundamentally do that. You know, we're never going to be able to get away from the, the activity of the of the people on the ground you know, managing the physical asset. And I think this is the thing is it's around understanding that these things not that anybody here has done this, but I think there tends to be a runaway from this, that somehow we will supplant physical reality with things. We will supplant, you know, 5,000 years of human life where we've lived in, in groups larger than hunter-gatherer hunter -gatherer bands. That's hard to unwind, and that's not going to be unwound. You know, it can definitely change. I'm not saying it won't, but I'm saying that it will nest in, and the way that it will nest in will create all kinds of things that we haven't thought about yet. So we should fundamentally pursue improvements on all the levels, levels that we've talked about. I completely agree with that. I'm just saying that the interesting thing will be as it finds its way into existing ways of doing things. You know, it doesn't necessarily supplant. It layers in and creates something weird. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. And I think that's the kind of thing we just need to keep in mind in the background while we're thinking. I love that point, Jeff. Very poetic, too. Although I tend to lean more towards Alexi de Tocqueville and his predictions for the U.S. And I think he was spot on with uh, his predictions from the 1800s on, on the size of the country. But more importantly, on the, the fact that um, in America, the things that make life easiest for us are also the things that work against us the hardest. And so it's going to be important for us to resist the urge of letting AI do too much for us, make life too easy for us. And more importantly, to let AI be too involved in making critical decisions. It's okay to let AI inform you as part of a decision set, uh, a set of information for making that decision, but it's not okay to let AI make that decision, make that choice for you. And so there is going to need to be a structure, a decision-making structure that allows humans to gather the, this information and make the choice that truly is best for the company with AI as just one data point. But because it is so comprehensive and it sounds so good and, and it makes so much sense, it writes very well, and it has this ability to personalize to our own emotions, the temptation is going to be huge to let it start driving decisions more than is healthy for an organization. You know, when it comes to the future, I, I lean on Drucker. He's showing, really showing my age now. But he said the best way to predict the future is to create it. I want to be at the forefront creating the future. I don't want to try to predict it. I'm looking for, like I said earlier, I'm looking for that opportunity where I can create that future. And I hope that a lot of retailers in all industries grasp this shift that we're going through and understand they need to start creating their own future. And whether or not the herd of consumers, humans follows them, well, that's 
that's just part of the fun of being in business, right? You either get it right or you get it wrong. Even with AI, you may get it wrong because of what you feed that data system. Somebody asked me last week at a, at a session, you know, can you define the future of stores? And I said, well, I'm going to try. So, but I, I didn't go down the path of painting a picture of, you know, the store is media, that all this technology and everything in the store. I didn't. I said, it's going to be part of it. But here's what it really is. Retailing has always been an art. And the people who have the most intense artistic abilities behind them are the ones that create these retail environments that are passionate and drive traffic to them. It also has to be aspirational. Because if you think back to 100 years ago, because we weren't there, service was everything, right? There, was, there were humans behind the counters, because we don't have them anymore behind the counters at department stores, serving your every need. Do you want to know about a product? They knew about that one section at the counter more than anyone else did. The music was playing. You could smell the perfumes. Everything was just pristine in there, right? And it was aspirational. You left, and there's something that I learned living in China, that the Chinese are always aspiring to the future because they know where they've come from. The future is waiting for them. And we need to bring that back in retailing to be aspirational because it's not. It's bloody boring still. And the third thing is you're not going to get there without information, data, and the technology behind it. We can call it AI. We can call it whatever we want. You're not going to get there without it. You need to understand the journey that you've been on, the information that you, you've collected over time, and how that fits in. And using that store experience and pushing it backwards again through that omni-channel and conveying it back to consumers so that it becomes the life. One thing I found that's fascinating, I hear everybody talking about the omni-channel and how you can bring that to life in the store. I'm going, no, 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 no. It's the reverse. Bring the store to life and bring that message to the omni-channel. That is what you do. That is how you create retailing. It's supposed to be an art. Start thinking that way. So we've had a pretty wide ranging conversation around a, a couple of points we, we departed from as an attempt to uh, try and wrap this up because there's been some really quite profound thinking going on here. Uh, just to remind us that we were thinking about some of the checklists and the major points of uh, things that should be in place before I embark on this technology journey. And the other one is around organizational design. We talked about silos and stuff. Is there any final thoughts that uh, you'd like to share with the audience? If I had any final thought, I think I would pick it up from what George just said, which is I think that we spend, particularly in retail, there is too much energy going to make things scientific when they're not necessarily. And I think it's about using, again, it comes back to the point I opened with, which is it's a, understand what problem you're trying to solve and then use the appropriate tool to solve it. And I think that's that's where the opportunity sits, is that I think we've almost let the pendulum swing too far. And I think we need to come back and understand that there's a great deal of art to this. And that doesn't in any way diminish the science that underpins it. But there is something like I was, I've just used the example, I'll stop this. I was in Philly last week and in Philadelphia, you know, it was Pomawana Makers, which is now owned by Macy's, but was the world's first department store. And you go in there, there is a three-story pipe organ, right? It was spectacle. You know, there's this grand gallery that looks down on it, and I mean, everything about it is spectacle. It's this enormous eagle that's on a statue as you walk through. Everything about it was spectacle. And when it was set up, it was it was partially that was it. You know, there was, I'm sure, an enormous amount of cost counting that, that sat behind it. You know, there was this huge organization that sat behind Wanamaker's. But the idea there was was art. And I think, you know, that was innovation at the time when it was founded. Because nobody created a, a department store like this before. And I think that's the whole thing we can see is that as we find ourselves with a new technology that could potentially drive novel things, is don't forget that that, that, that novelty will be manifest for those that ultimately buy things from you by art, by the art side of it. And so I think if anything, it's this idea is to not forget the spectacle side of things. I think you're you're spot on, Jeff. Retailing really is an art, as George said. And, and I think AI is going to require a level of discipline in our thinking and our decision making that we have not experienced in the past because so much is possible. Just because it's possible, it should it be done? Can and should are two very different things. It comes back to the customer. 
And it's going to be essential for retailers to understand what their customers truly want more than ever before. And there is a, a long history of, of companies giving employees and retailers what they think they want, but not what they actually want. Two-hour delivery being a great example is that's a manufacturer entirely of the retailer's choice. Customers never really asked for it, but now that it's here, sure, great, fine. Uh, it turns out it's not profitable and it was kind of a, a bad idea and it wasn't what the customer really wanted. All they wanted was reliability on when something would be delivered and they didn't mind paying for it as long as it was transparent and affordable and reasonable fair, really a fair price for fair wage or fair service. Retailers have lost touch with all of that. I love the, the three-story pipe organ, but I also hope they've backed it up with products and services that the retailer actually wants. Otherwise, that, that pipe organ is, is just spectacle and not actually uh, part of a meaningful experience. Uh, I'm going to tag this on. We're all chasing the same thing, right? In terms of retailing, everybody's trying to develop a customer experience that wows the customers. But consumers are in a place where I mentioned earlier, it's, it's about convenience. And if you can tie that convenience back to um, delivering an experience, then you've actually got a winning strategy. But at the end of the day, if you're going to be successful, uh, if you want to be successful, you know, the, the key here is humans. Humans actually have this incredible power to communicate uh, better than a machine ever will. And they can tell your brand story better than any machine will, better than any omni-channel will. And if you invest in them, uh, because you know, whatever savings, I've said to companies that whatever savings you get out of the technology you're going pursuing right now, I hope you put it in the front lines. Because we, including myself, we have thinned out the herd so badly out there that, you know, we're trying to create customer experiences with one person serving three to five people. It's a pipe dream, right? So, and if you bring in the pipe organ because you think that'll, dis that'll distract them for a while, maybe, but at the end of the day, you need human to human contact. And the one thing I've learned is that it's hard to disrupt a business that has very strong human to human relationships going on with the shopper and the employees who tell the brand story. Thanks everybody. That was uh, some really profound messaging throughout the podcast. I, I think a much sort of broad takeaway is clearly what problem you're trying to solve as you think about AI, but more importantly, um, where does a customer feature on this and what are we doing with our frontline staff? I think they're, they're the resounding and longer term issues that we have to face up to. The rest of the thing, I think that AI will organize or help us to organize in different ways, maybe. So thanks everybody for listening to the end. Look forward to putting out another podcast in, in due course and uh, you're tuning into that. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your organization. You can connect with me via my website, retailaid.ca, go to the contact page or via LinkedIn and connect with me there. Please feel free to follow the experts on this podcast for more insights and to join in the conversation. I look forward to collaborating with you and playing an active part with your supply chain and businesses transformation as you are inspired to think big, be bold, scale, adapt, and win.